Hi, my name is Aline Warden. I am a licensed registered respiratory therapist. Have been a respiratory therapist for many years now. And I am going to speak to you a little bit today about the field of sleep medicine. If you are like most people, you get a little confused at the notion of sleep as a medical field. I grew up thinking sleep was what you had to do every night so that your brain could rest. However, as I got into respiratory, I found out that that isn't so. Sleep influences absolutely everything that goes on in your body. Sleep medicine began as a way to diagnose sleep apnea. And because it, apnea means no breathing, respiratory got involved, and we've sort of helped develop the field. It grew over time into something called polysomnography. Anytime you're in medicine, if you can use 10 syllables instead of two, you're gonna do it. So polysomnography simply means study of sleep and a graph to accompany it. Once it became clear in um, doing sleep medicine that sleep was more than just for brain rest, the field just kind of bloomed. Now doctors can take special classes and pass certification tests and they can be certified sleep specialists uh, who treat and diagnose or diagnose and treat sleep disorders. I also just found out that there's now a certification for dentists so that you can be a certified sleep dentist. Um, that's very, very new. I kind of thought that was my orthodontist um, because what they do is work with people with little mouthpieces and we'll discuss that later but that is what a sleep dentist does. Before we start talking about sleep studies, I want to let you know something about the conditions that can be diagnosed or treated through polysomnography. There again, you think you go to sleep, it's because your brain's tired. Well, your brain does a whole lot more than um, just get tired and just go to sleep. If you aren't sleeping well, you can have something called shift work sleep disorder. We're here in Eastern North Carolina. Everybody um, either works or knows someone who works at a hospital, at one of the large um, plants like Potash or um, Domtar in Plymouth. People work around the clock. You get into the habit of it, you never really think much about um, the fact that if you are sleeping while the sun's out, that this causes a disorder in your um, sleep patterns and can cause you health problems. So that's now an official diagnosis. There is something called obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is when you um, lay down to go to sleep and all of the muscles in your throat, including your tongue, get really relaxed and it cut, cuts off your airway. This is also um, you also see this a lot with people who are very overweight. Just the mass of the um, tissue in their neck can cut off their airway. And that's something that, um, once it's diagnosed, can be handled through mechanical means like a CPAP. Central sleep apnea. Well, in the early days of diagnosing sleep apneas, obstructive sleep apnea was all that the neurologist and the doctors thought was there and yet they still had some people that weren't helped by CPAP. And in conjunction with studying brain injured patients and with uh, premature newborns, it became apparent that a part of the brain can either be damaged or not fully developed, and that will cause you to um, quit breathing while you're asleep. That isn't helped by CPAP or anything. That's called central sleep apnea and a sleep study can help determine if your problem is obstructive or mechanical or central physiological. And some people unfortunately have a combination of the two. Um, that used to be called combination sleep apnea, but no, we've had to come up with something better than that's now called complex sleep apnea. Restless leg syndrome. Um, I work with a sleep lab he had a gentleman uh, call one day, was very aggravated because his sleep study 
um, showed that he did not need a CPAP, that what he needed was to see the neurologist about medication for his restless legs. And he was very undone that he was going to be charged a couple thousand dollars for somebody to tell him that his legs jumped during the night. So we had this long discussion about how restless leg syndrome is a true sleep disorder, and not all sleep disorders can be treated with a BiPAP or a CPAP machine. And I've got some um, pictures that I'll show you restless leg in a minute. Pickwickian syndrome is something else that can be diagnosed um, by polysomnography. It's really more influenced by it. Um, if you are in medical field long enough, you can almost diagnose someone with Pickwickian by looking at them. This tends, and this is from the, a Dickens character. Um, I'm not big on Dickens, so I'm not real sure. I guess it was the um, character in the Pickwickian papers or the Pickwick papers. Um, again, the person who has Pickwickian syndrome tends to be short, very stout, have a really short neck, and a very large belly, gut, so that when this person lays down to go to sleep, you've got all that weight in a short package and a real thick neck, and to treat Pickwickian, you have to do lots of things, but um, CPAP or BiPAP is, is the first choice. Narcolepsy, sleeping sickness. Um, it's really not a, a sickness, it's more of a disorder where um, if you have that, you can just be sit standing like I'm doing now, and if I had narcolepsy and um, was having an episode, I might fall asleep right where I stand. Um, it is not extremely prevalent in the United States, but it is here, and in some third world countries, there are some insects um, that carry a virus that, that very closely mimics narcolepsy, and you do sometimes in literature read about people who, um, entire villages that have the sleeping sickness, and that can be taken care of um, with medication. Epilepsy is something else that can be diagnosed by polysomnography. Um, and in reality, when you are doing a, a sleep study with all the little wires all over your head and everything, a lot of that is an EEG or an electroencephalogram, excuse me, which is something that neurologists use to diagnose different um, disorders involving the brain, the spine, and your nerves. And there is a certain kind of epilepsy called sleep-related epilepsy where you don't have seizures unless you're asleep. This is a, a fairly new discovery, probably within the last 10 years, that can be directly related back to sleep studies. Uh, here's a good one, um, ADHD in children. If you have a hyperactive child, um, you might want to consider a sleep study um, because sleepiness, excessive sleepiness, can manifest itself in two ways. And in children, it typically manifests itself by um, causing hyperactivity. Um, children tend to react to things um, almost in the opposite way than adults do. An adult with um, a sleep disorder or with obstructive sleep apnea, they're going to be really tired all day, really sleepy, really lethargic, not want to do too much. Child, on the other hand, may very well react completely opposite, bouncing off the walls just like you fed them a five-pound bag of sugar. Again, excessive daytime sleepiness. Insomnia, if you don't sleep well at night, then you start not sleeping. And insomnia can build on itself if it goes on for longer than five or six days. You probably ought to consult your doctor. Um, there is actually uh, in the literature a case of a gentleman who developed insomnia and it kept on and kept on and kept on. And he eventually, um, they tried all these different medicines and things, and he was ad admitted um, as an inpatient, and there was nothing that they could do with this gentleman to put him to sleep in the, the REM, or rapid eye movement part of sleep. They just could not get his brain to trigger that. And after about 25 or 30 days, the gentleman died 
Um, so that's uh, one way that you can, or something you can really look at to show that sleep is absolutely um, imperative if you're going to function and be healthy. Nightmares are a sleep disorder. Night terrors. Most adults don't have uh, night terrors. That's usually something that you see in small children that's hopefully gone by the time they are age three. But if you're an adult who has night terrors, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're screaming, you're scared to death, your heart's about to pound out of your chest, you could probably um, use a sleep study. There um, are medications that you can take that will take care of that and that is a very dangerous thing. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking is a sleep disorder. Um, once I started reading through all of this, I thought, well, good Lord, everything's a sleep disorder. Um, back to night terrors and sleepwalking. When you're in REM sleep, the rapid eye movement, you're in and out of, if you're sleeping well, you're in and out of that several times throughout the course of the night. Um, if you wake up too quickly from REM sleep, or if you enter it too quickly when you lay down, say that you're extremely tired, and this used to happen to me when I was much younger and had a whole lot more energy, I would lay down, I'd immediately be asleep in that REM sleep, and within minutes, I would wake up screaming and trying to figure out who was in my room. Um, my husband thought I had lost my mind, and, and he certainly should have, because I, I truly saw um, usually people in Confederate type gowns and, and uniforms. I don't know what I was watching on TV at the time, but I finally found out what that was. When you fall into REM sleep too quickly, um, and you are dreaming while you have just zoomed into that, it's called a hypnagogic hallucination. Uh, I, I love that term. I um, have wanted for years to have a reason to stand up in front of people and say hypnagogic hallucination. So I thank y'all for inviting me to do this so I can. I also found out when researching for um, this uh, talk that if you wake up too suddenly from your REM sleep, now hypnagogic is when you go into it too suddenly, but if you wake up too suddenly from REM sleep, that's called hypnopompic hallucinations. And you can have those as well. And some of the literature that um, I read uh, says that a majority of people that have hypnopompic hallucinations um, are, see small animals. There's no explanation for that. Um, and I'm sure somebody will do a study on it one day but uh, just remember, if you suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and you think you've got a squirrel sitting on your chest, you're probably having a hypnopompic hallucination. Sleep-related asthma. Um, in respiratory, we deal with all kinds of breathing situations, but did you know that you can have asthma caused by not sleeping well? You can also have asthma caused by not sleeping well when the not sleeping well is related to um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. You see the commercials on TV for GERD, GERD, Nexium, things like that. All of this, when you're laying down to sleep, if you're not sleeping well and you perhaps have, like most of us, maybe carrying a little bit too much weight or you ate a little too late at night, over time, this can cause a lot of acid buildup. This buildup erodes your esophagus and you end up with um, what is commonly called sleep-related asthma. Depression. If you don't get enough sleep, you get depressed. Panic disorder. Uh, that's another thing that um, people a lot of times, if they are chronically tired, end up with a panic disorder. Um, Bruxism, and here comes the dentist again. Bruxism is a, is a nice big word for uh, teeth grinding. A lot of people don't realize it, but they grind their teeth at night. Um, you wake up with a headache, your jaws hurt. Um, as you get older, uh, your dentist may notice that your teeth are kind of crooked, uh, where it looks like they're unevenly worn down. 
and um, that is a sleep disorder. And again, the dentist, I happen to have bruxism, um, and my orthodontist actually made this little gadget for me. I have had similar ones to this. I mean, he's been making them for me since I was, well, let's just say for about 30 years. Um, but what this does, uh, put it in my mouth, stabilizes my jaw. It's also built up so that when I grind my teeth, um, I, I don't gnash them together. And it actually is built up so when I have this in, I can't close my mouth all the way. That also keeps an airway. So if I ever were to have sleep apnea, um, I would have the airway for the air to get in as I breathe. And that is one of the things that um, allows dentists to be uh, sleep dentist. Now, here's the goodie. This is my favorite thing that um, lack of sleep or inadequate sleep can cause. It can cause obesity. See, all of you out there like me, carrying a few extra pounds, had no idea all you needed was about, oh, six years of good sleep. Obesity isn't just from eating too much, or at least that's what I keep trying to tell myself, but the body produces something called a hormone um, called cortisol, and it also makes an appetite increasing or stimulating hormone called ghrelin. When you don't sleep enough, the body overproduces cortisone and it overproduces ghrelin, and you get fat or put on weight without doing anything. That's why, um, you know, if you've ever, your clothes are getting too tight, you're not sure why, you're too busy at work, you're chasing the kids, or you're trying to go to school or doing all those things, and you think, I'm doing all this stuff, there's no way that I am putting on weight, I don't even have time to eat. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep and your cortisol and your ghrelin are kind of out of control. Um, a lack of sleep uh, can also lead to an increase in diabetes, hypertension, stroke, and some kinds of cancer. Um, a lot of cancers are autoimmune disorders and your immune system is very heavily impacted by how much sleep and the quality of sleep that you get. And sometimes um, you can kind of, if you have some of the the warning signs or you have some precancerous cells and something and your doctor says, well, we need to look at this. A lot of times anymore in the last several years, they're starting to also recommend uh, sleep studies to see um, if maybe an improvement in your sleep can kind of head some of this stuff off at the pass. Now we've talked about all of these things that sleep studies um, can diagnose. One more thing that I thought was interesting, really doesn't have anything to do with um, sleep studies, but in reading over all of this, have you ever wondered about why you don't act out your dreams, why you dream this stuff and it's so vivid and, and you wake up and you, you know, sometimes they're just such wonderful dreams and you're like, oh my gosh, why, why am I not doing that? Why didn't I do that? Fun fact for the day, when you're in REM sleep and dreaming, your skeletal muscles are paralyzed and that's why you don't act out your dreams. And that paralysis goes away as soon as you go out of REM sleep. So when you're in REM sleep, you're not moving a whole lot, um, but it's the other, um, the other stages of sleep where you move around the most. Some of the treatments for uh, sleep disorders, um, I guess one of the most common that people use when you sort of self-medicate at home, and I'm really bad about this, uh, is to use a stimulant like caffeine. You know, I have my coffee in the morning and I generally don't drink any more coffee throughout the day, but um, I've got this really bad thing for Red Bull, the, the sugar-free kind, and that stuff isn't good for you if you use too much of it. What most people don't understand is that Caffeine can kind of build up in your body, and as you continue to have your coffee or your soft drinks or your energy drinks, even tea if you drink too much of it, your body is kind of getting desensitized to the fact that you are tired. 
Um, what caffeine does is sort of stimulates your little neurons in your brain, but after a while, not only has it stimulated, but it also dulls your neurons so that you need more and more of it to continue to have the awake effect. So that by the time you go to bed, you've got all this caffeine in your system and you can't go to sleep, but you're tired. Your body doesn't know what it needs to be thinking. Your brain's firing off these neurons and they're kind of hit and miss and nothing's really working. And a lot of times when that happens, what do people do at that point? Say, well, okay, I can't sleep. Maybe I'll have a drink. Alcohol before bed is absolutely one of the very worst things you can do if you want to have a good night's sleep. Yeah, once in a while, you're not able to go to sleep. You know you got to go to work the next day. You know, I'll have a drink, I'll have a beer, I'll have a glass of wine, I'll wind down. Well, in moderation, that's not so bad. But after a while, the alcohol that put you to sleep starts to keep you up. Um, I used to work in mental health and we did a whole lot. Um, we had a detox center and it was always interesting to um, talk to some of the people who were in detox and a lot of them had really started having a really bad drinking problem because they couldn't sleep so they were drinking. Couldn't sleep so they drank and well I mean that wasn't the only reason you know People don't become alcoholics just because they can't sleep. But it's one of those things that just sort of builds on itself, and then all of a sudden, without warning, you have what we call a rebound effect. The alcohol was making you sleepy, now it's rebounded with your body, and now it's gonna keep you awake. Best thing to do, avoid alcohol for at least an hour, probably two before you go to sleep. Also, you need to avoid um, computer screens, um, your smartphones, um, even really graphic television, especially on the high definition TVs. Not sure why high def um, makes that much difference, but there have been studies that show that uh, interacting with these different electronic screens um, right before bed causes a decrease in REM sleep. So you need to put all that stuff away and read a boring book. Um, how much sleep do you need? person needs an adult, healthy adult, needs at least seven hours of sleep every night. It's much better if you can get eight. Some people actually require nine or ten. Six or less, however, really causes a lot of problems for your body. A recent study um, showed that getting less than that, and they, they took a group of healthy people they let them sleep, you know, seven, eight, nine hours a night for a couple weeks. And then for 16 days, they limited them to less than six hours of sleep. And every day they did all these blood tests. And what they were able to find is that um, a chronic lack of sleep actually changes your genetic makeup. It messes with the RNA that's inside the DNA. And I'm, nobody wants that explanation but it just totally disrupts the building blocks of your body. So if you typically get less than uh, six hours of sleep a night, you are aging yourself faster, you're at risk for lots of diseases, and you're probably a little overweight. We, talked to, we were gonna talk about treatments. CPAP and BiPAP are um, devices for obstructive sleep disorder, little machine, um, wear a mask and it forces the air into your system and opens up the, your throat where your tongue or your um, the fatty tissue is sort of compressing down. That's probably, um, it used to be the simplest fix until um, they came out with oral appliances and you're seeing a lot of those now, um, especially if the person, if you're not overweight and the problem just seems to be your tongue relaxes too much. These oral appliances will keep your teeth from, from touching, but give you something to sort of bite down on because most of us do kind of keep our mouths closed while we sleep. 
and it all, they also have sort of a hole in them so that you're getting your oxygen. There's also surgery. Um, sometimes sleep studies don't diagnose a sleep apnea or they don't diagnose an obstructive apnea that an appliance can fix. Um, my husband used to snore horribly and after about 10 years of it, I woke up one night in the middle of the night and said, you're going to have a sleep study or you're moving down the hall. Well, he had a sleep study and the sleep study showed that he did indeed have sleep apnea, but it was not obstructive. And in some of the graphs and pictures I have, I'll show you the little lines that they were able to tell that by. So he had to go to um, an ear, nose and throat specialist and it was determined that um, because of all of his years um, doing judo and karate, his nose had been broken several times and was improperly set because he thinks he's a cowboy and he would set it himself. And he, one nostril was completely 100% blocked off. The other one was about 60% blocked off. And over time, he had, um, you know, your body will adjust and will adapt and he had fallen into the habit of always sleeping with his mouth open. And um, when they looked in the back of his mouth, his soft palate, which is the back of your throat really, was very enlarged. Um, in this part of um, his face, were something called the turbinates, and they were all enlarged. And his uvula, that little dangly thing in the back of your throat, that was enlarged and his two front teeth had started to V in. And all of that was because he was breathing funny when he slept at night. He had surgery, they remade his nose, they thinned out all this stuff here, they went in the back of his mouth, thinned all that out, removed his uvula, now he can't gargle, and now he doesn't snore anymore. He sleeps very well, and honest to God, the teeth have straightened back out. Uh, it was really kind of an amazing thing to watch. Um, so there are surgical options for that. Sometimes if you can't sleep or you're not getting good sleep, uh, another option is a medication for sleep. Um, Ambien is um, a well-known sleep medicine, um, Rosarum. There are several on the market now and typically they say if you are going to use one of those medications, you need to be where you're going to be um, don't plan on doing anything for seven or eight hours and make sure that you won't be interrupted. Um, when I was in respiratory school and doing some night work, I took Ambien and um, they aren't kidding. You take that, that little pill and all of a sudden, 30 minutes later, I mean, it was like I was talking to somebody. I was like, gee, I need to lay down. And then the next thing I knew, it was eight hours later. And um, no real side effects from it. Some people, especially people with shift, uh, shift work disorder, have to have sleep medication and may have to have it for most of their lives. And all the research is showing that that's not, um, not really harmful because it does allow them to get their REM sleep. Weight loss is a good way to improve your sleep. Um, I talked about avoiding alcohol and caffeine. Now, for those of you with children, um, it's really kind of hard sometimes to make sure your kids go to sleep and stay asleep, but it is extremely important that your children get enough sleep. Um, babies, infants, as we all know, may sleep anywhere from 20 to 22 hours a day. Um, their brain needs that, needs it to grow. Children require less sleep as they get older, but even up until they are probably 10, they still require eight, nine, sometimes 10 hours of sleep a, a night. And it's extremely important that you structure your life so that your kids can get that sleep. They'll do better in school, they will be healthier, and most likely they will be calmer. Um, children kind of get away from needing so much sleep um, when they hit about 11 or 12 
and then they hit about 13 or 14 and it all starts over again. If you have a teenager and you can't get them to go to bed, there's a reason for that. About this time in a person's life after puberty as they hit their teens, kids, um, their circadian rhythms sort of change and they want to sleep later but they want to stay up later and during free time a lot of times they want to sleep more a period of really active brain growth a couple of schools um, in the United States were considering I don't know if they ever did it or not but were considering um, making the high schoolers days um, start much later and then continue into school you know, into the later afternoon because teenagers are so much more awake and so much more alert um, from, say, noon until six. Uh, that's because of that, sh that change in their circadian rhythm. So if you get a teenager that, or you have a teenager and they got up fine and everything was great and then all of a sudden hit about 14 or 15 and you can't drag them out of the bed and they want to stay up all night, there is actually uh, a biological reason for that. But that does calm down as they get into their 20s and they um, kind of go back and develop a, a, a more normal circadian rhythm. Before I conclude, I had a few not real great pictures, but um, just to give you an example of what we have been talking about, these are brain waves. The top one is how your brain looks when you're excited. It's called a beta wave. Right under that, you're relaxed. That's called an alpha wave. Everything, um, again, you start dealing in anything medical and we're gonna immediately revert to Greek and Latin. Not sure why even the Greeks don't like to speak Greek, but we still do it. Third one down, drowsy. Your brain waves are kinda getting crunched in, but they're further apart. Next, you're asleep. And then the bottom one is when you are in deep sleep. And that's called a delta wave, and that's part of your um, REM sleep. And if you had an eye, um, that's what your brain's doing. And if your eyes were hooked up, your eyes would be making really quick little squigglies. Um, the next two pictures that I'm going to show you, there was a patient who had very bad night terrors and... Um, could not get any sleep, lots of different things going on with this young woman. And so they hooked her up for a sleep study in a medical facility um, because so many strange things were going on with her at night that she couldn't even go to a sleep center. She had to actually be an inpatient in a hospital. And this right here is just her um, all of the electrodes from when she was sitting up in bed talking. Um, up at the top where you have a lot of the black lines but they're further spaced apart. Those um, are her eye movements and her brain movement. Everything is pretty normal. Uh, you get down about midway the page. Looks like two really straight lines but with one clump of really jagged black in the middle. Um, she moved her leg. Those are leg movements. The next really heavy lines that you see um, are when she is actually talking. Um, the, the big bursts of black is when um, she is saying a whole lot and is pretty excited with it. The rest of it she is just talking. So this is um, fairly normal. Now the next one, it actually has a picture of her hooked up but then it has um, a color screen um, and this is while she's asleep. Up at the top, the, the real dark concentration of all the really bright red, um, she is having night terrors. Uh, up above that, um, the smaller black lines, those are just her eye movements, but the, the really heavy concentration of red, um, she was having a really bad dream, a night terror. Uh, you go on down the page and you see, um, I believe you might call this color light blue or teal, and there's two lines of that. She also has extreme restless leg. Um, 
had no idea, she had no idea that her legs moved that much, but um, her legs were just jumping all around. You can't really get very much sleep if you're doing that. Her heart stayed fairly normal. Um, her pulse was okay. The, um, the, uh, the real bright green line down there, um, she's snoring a little bit. And then uh, her oxygen level is the red down at the bottom. What you can see is a very big difference. And just with these graphs, you can tell you know what's going on in a person's brain. And because so many people snore, the last little um, poster thing that I have right here, this is how we tell if you're snoring a lot. Uh, you'll notice the arrows there, and if you're close enough to the screen, you can see it says something called nasal P. When they hook you up for a sleep study, they've probably got 20 different little electrodes that go everywhere, the belt around your waist. Um, probes on your fingers and everything it goes uh, into a computer and records something. So the nasal P um, is recording when you get apneic. Um, and when you snore, that's pretty much what happens. You, you stop breathing. And the person who, um, these things are only three seconds at best. You know, the, each little block is three seconds. But um, this person in this, you can tell from looking at it, uh, stopped breathing while he or she was snoring. And then down below you have um, where it says SpO2. That's your uh, oxygen saturation in your blood, the little thing they put on your finger. Well, when you don't breathe, you're not getting any oxygen in normal healthy adult oxygen concentration is 99 to 100. Um, this person oxygen dropped from 88 to 83 to 86. Then he started rousing himself, kind of took another couple of breaths, got up to 95 and we're back down to 83 again. And all of this is in a 12 second period. Um, people that have sleep studies have um, been measured to stop breathing as much as um, 250, 300 times in an hour, um, which, you know, if you're not breathing any more often than that, then no wonder you wake up tired. That's just some of the things that a sleep study will tell you and, and what it looks like when it tells you that. I had hoped to bring in an entire study until I realized that a typical sleep study, if you um, are hooked up between six and eight hours, if the study is printed out, um, it is about 1,500 pages long. Um, and that's another reason I didn't go into um, polysomnography, because looking at all of those pages, I don't think would be a whole lot of fun. I have a great deal of respect for the people who can do that without uh, completely losing their mind over the squiggly lines. I hope that you have taken something from this, that you will be able to um, use some of what you've heard uh, for more than maybe writing a paper, or at least it gave you a little food for thought. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and enjoy the rest of your class. Thank you.